in in three, two, and one. Buonasera, Raizani, Admici, Sorella Mia. Benvenuti alla nostra festa della donna. Good evening, and welcome to Noia's celebration of International Women's Day. My name is Pat Tinto, and I'm excited to welcome you tonight as the newly elected president of the National Organization of Italian American Women, or NOIA for short. NOIA is commemorating its 41st year as a nonprofit for women in Italian ancestry. Our mission is to connect, inspire, and empower women by offering cultural and educational programming, such as the unique event we have starting soon. We invest in our young women through mentorship, scholarship, and exchange programs, and we foster alliances with Italian and Italian-American groups in support of our shared history, culture, and language. La Festa della Donna, or International Women's Day, is observed on March 8th all over the world as a day to shine a light on women's economic, political, artistic, and social achievements. An important day in Italy, the holiday traces the feminist struggle for equality and the recognition of the dignity and value, excuse me, and value of women's contributions to society. Tonight, it is especially fitting that we focus on the history of midwif midwifery, or as Jennifer Anton has aptly named, the original working woman. While many of us might be familiar with this particular group of dedicated frontline or first-line workers who for centuries had been ushering in new life, few of us are aware of the hardships and struggles of women during fascism in Italy and how many basic rights were pre um, to preventive and prenatal healthcare and education were denied under Mussolini's rule. Our expert panel representing four time zones, three countries and two continents will talk to us live about the medical profession and its history from ancient to modern times. Now, let me introduce our moderator. Jennifer Anton is an American Italian dual citizen born in Gillette, Illinois, <clears throat> excuse me, and now lives between London and Lake Como, Italy. A proud advocate for women's rights and equality, she hopes to rescue women's stories from history, starting with her Italian family and a special bouquet of flowers to compliment to Jennifer, who after 14 years of intensive and grueling labor is celebrating the birth of her book baby with the launch of her historical novel, Under the Light of the Italian Moon. She will introduce the panelists and also describe how she came to write this novel while tracing her Italian grandmother's life and career in medicine. In the chat later, you will find a link to buy the book, if you like, at the Italian American Bookstore, or I am, an independent bookseller who served as a cultural hub for Italian Americans and authors in Boston. And now we will head across the pond where it is approaching midnight and let Jennifer introduce our special guests and the program. Jennifer, tocca a te. <laughs> Grazie. Ciao, Ciao, everyone. Ciao. And thank you for joining us on International Women's Day. Pat, thank you so much. Congratulations on the role. And thank you so much to the National Organization of Italian American Women for bringing this programming forward. Everyone, we can't see you tonight, but you're in our hearts and we know that you're out there. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here today to moderate this panel. This is a panel of dynamic women, of midwives and of women who have been studying midwives, which is incredibly exciting. And it's especially meaningful me to, me to me tonight because my novel, Under the Light of the Italian Moon, the book Baby is being born, as, as Pat mentioned. So it's born today. And this novel is a story of love and a story of women's resilience during the rise of fascism and World War II. It tells the story of Nina Argenta. She's the daughter of a strong-willed midwife. And this midwife is so strong that she's known in the town as La Capitana, She's professionally trained and she's a leader in her time. That midwife was my great, great grandmother. My biographical fiction novel is a tribute to these unsung heroes, these women who sacrificed in silence during the rise of fascism, during World War II, during Nazi occupation. And I really am excited to bring this book to you tonight and especially to talk about midwives and what they do, what they have, have done in the past and what they're doing right now. So our panel conversation is gonna be about 30 to 40 minutes. And then uh, we will take questions from you guys. So I highly encourage you to put questions in the chat. Please participate. I am going to give away a signed copy of the novel to someone who is participating in the chat tonight. Um, we came up with a little methodology. Uh, so please do participate. And um, yeah, it's gonna be, go be very exciting at the end. We're really looking forward to that. So today I have with me 
three remarkable professionals and they really have made a career out of helping other women. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Cosman. Uh, her PhD dissertation embodied, embodied knowledge was actually something I used while I was writing the book. She actually has a book as well. It's called Contested Deliveries. So if you want to hear more about that, that's a great thing to look up after this. She was a very important resource for the novel. I also have with me practicing midwife in the UK, and she has also practiced in Italy. She's from Rome, Sibylla Grasso. Hi, Sibylla. How are you? Hello. Um, and then finally, we have practicing midwife in Chicago, Mary Sirocco. Hi, Mary. Hi. Uh, so Sibylla and I are in London. Mary is in Chicago, and Jennifer is in Pennsylvania. So we're all over the place. Thank you for being here, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, so just to get started, the first question I have is just, you know, can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to focus on midwifing, Jennifer, and then, um, you know, why you decided to, to midwife uh, Sibylla and Mary? What, what got you going on, on focusing on, on midwifing in Italy, uh, Jennifer? Can you tell us? Sure. Well, first, um, let me just say that I'm really delighted to be here. And thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. And thank you, Noya, for supporting us. Um, yeah, so uh, when I was working on um, my uh, graduate uh, work, I was interested in the question of how and why societies aim to control reproduction and sexuality and what impact that has on communities and individuals. And I realized pretty quickly um, that midwives are central to answering that question because they um, still today and historically have acted as mediators between local communities and outside interests by um, organizations like states, um, medical authorities, and um, in Italy, particularly the Catholic Church. Um, and so I was really interested in this question of the mediating role that midwives played where they had to negotiate the outside interest um, of promoting fertility or repressing um, unwed pregnancy for interest, and then their local and intimate bonds with uh, women. Um, and um, midwives have um, for centuries sort of been targeted by these outside bodies as channels um, to promote certain values or instill um, uh, certain ideas or certain practices because they are sort of these, um, these important links between communities and outside authorities. That's interesting. It's between communities and, you know, the midwife is the female component, right? Because ultimately the hospitals and the, and the churches are, are led by men and the midwives are the way in kind of through the women. So that's fascinating that you decided to kind of follow that. Um, Sibylla, what, what's your thought on that? What, why, did you, um, why did you end up getting into midwifing? What was, what was your passion there? <laughs> my reason is far more personal because um, um, I lost my mom when I was 16 and since then I always knew I wanted to you know to be with other me women with other moms um, so it was more of a, a tragic event in my life that actually I realized that I wanted to be with them you know so yeah okay beautiful I, I didn't know that that had happened to you I'm sorry that you lost your mom but it's beautiful that she inspired what you decided to do yeah absolutely yeah it was incredible yeah yeah so you're kind of giving back to her her in her spirit absolutely. Every single yeah day. it's it's very um rewarding yeah I feel that although I lost something when I was 16 actually it makes sense in a way mm -hmm. that's really beautiful it's interesting because one of the things I explore in the book is connection with mothers and the evolution of mothers and daughters even after death and I think that we, our relationships with our mothers actually continue um, no matter what. So that, that's, that's really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Mary, what, what brought you to midwifery? Well, when I was in nursing school, I did a summer internship in labor and delivery. And I was struck by the difference with the type of care that the patients received between the midwives and physicians. And mm. at that point, I realized that midwives really bear witness to a process, holding um, space to allow women to own their own birth, as opposed to doing something to them. And I knew at that point that that's where I was going to go with my nursing career. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. Um, 
Can I can I ask you, I, and I'm going to get back to what, what you just said, actually, now, Mary, with, with another question that I have later, but because um, I think it's interesting, the, the role that you're talking about and kind of wanting to wanting to give the women a little bit more control over over their birthing experience, etc. Um, can I ask, um, so what role have midwives played kind of in the past in the community to women and what role are they playing today? Jennifer, you started telling us a little bit about what role they played in terms of that connection, but what else, ha what else has been their role kind of in the community historically? Were they well respected and, and, and how did people view them? Yeah, so midwives were actually really central to communities um, in both a practical sense and a sort of ritual and symbolic sense. So first of all, practically speaking, they were the authorities on um, childbirth, but also a variety of diseases that affected particularly women and children. So they were fonts of medical knowledge. Um, but they also played um, sort of really important symbolic roles. So often after a mother delivered, she was expected to have a period of lying in before she entered public again. And so it was the midwife who often took the baby um, to be baptized in a local church. And for this, she received the name Godmother. Komare, which is um, an older uh, form for midwife before Levitri today or Astatrike come, comes into play. Um, and so they had um, this role sort of built in as, as symbolic um, uh, people who brought new life into the community, right? Baptism is that moment when a new life sort of formally enters the community. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, they also played an, a number of additional roles. So ju um, judicially, uh, midwives were really important to the legal system. Again, as sort of the experts on women's bodies, they might be called in to testify in a case of rape or infertility um, or when um, a marriage was desired to be annulled because um, there was no uh, pregnancy going on or, or it was accused that the marriage wasn't being consummated. Mm -hmm. um, so they also had a really important um, functional role as expert witnesses. Um, and then of course, midwives were known um, as both sort of promoters of orthodox religious practice and sometimes as um, uh, women who, who uh, mixed in a little bit of heterodox and, and folk rituals. And this became more or less problematic at certain times, um, but midwives were associated with all sorts of popular healing rituals and sometimes taking material from their work like the placenta to be turned into an amulet for protection of women and children. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would say that, that midwives weren't necessarily the best um, paid members of the community or the wealthiest, um, but they were owed a lot of respect. And sometimes mm -hmm. they sort of turn that respect back around by offering their services charitably to poor women who couldn't afford um, the fee for, for a midwife too. Mm -hmm. So they were absolutely fundamentally central mm -hmm. too. <laughs> to so what kinds, of, what kinds of things were they being paid with? Uh, yeah, so I mean, in money, if that was possible, but mm -hmm. I've also th seen things like chocolate, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> other food. It was typical for a midwife to maybe stay overnight, particularly if a, a labor was prolonged. Um, so food and lodging. Um, in Venice, I've seen a lot of times midwives paid for travel. Um, and you see things like, oh, the weather was terrible and I had to, you know, get, get in a boat and come all this way. Um, so... Um, and then one, one of the sort of the reasons that I see midwives in the archives is also when there were problems and when they weren't paid. Um, and so mm. that might be in a case where a midwife, say, was um, uh, delivering a woman who um, maybe was unwed and pregnant. And so it was a bit of a secret. Um, and, and she might have ended up being gypped by, mm. um, by, by the consort, by the man. Um, and so then we see the midwife is sometimes will sort of throw loyalties to her customers, say, um, to the wind and, you know, protect herself and, and mm. uh, solicit um, uh, aid from an, uh, an official body, a health board, um, to try to get her compensation. Um, wow. Yeah, so, I read, yeah. I, you know, I read of midwives being paid with chickens and all kinds of kind of, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you had. I yeah. mean, 
Yeah. Bella, maybe you even know um, from, you know, from Italy's perspective, maybe you heard stories and so forth too of, you know, the types of things that you, uh, or that they used to get paid. And I don't know if you've been paid with a chicken lately. <laughs> I hope no, we still, we still go with chocolate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, from your perspective, Sibylla, um, in terms of the role in the community, what, what do you think the role is today? Do you think it's as well respected as it was back then? And, and how do you think it's changed? Um, I think in Italy at the moment, um, it sounds so familiar to what Jennifer just said. I think there's a there's a this um, this, this new wave, this new change um, with lots of independent midwives who are kind of going back to what the role used to be um, in terms of how it was respected and all these uh, very unusual rituals that was so natural for the mid for a midwife back 100 years ago and I think it's 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 coming back um, stronger with with a strong identity unlike maybe for example 10 20 years ago where midwives was more like um, a role within the hospital setting because there wasn't an independent midwifery as such it was lost completely I think and now there is this coming back of all that role uh, completely detached from the hospital but at the same time as a vessel like as a as a way to connect the woman to the hospital almost like a more uh, natural you think that has to do with kind of some of the more natural um, trends that have been happening and things like that and kind of demedicalization to a certain extent or less drugs, less things like that, or, or just wellness trends in general, do you think might be the reason or? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think people, women know, uh, know a little bit more about it and I think they want to change to want, yeah. they want to make that change. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I've seen a lot more education. I've seen, you know, it's interesting because now with social media, there's, I follow a lot of midwives online and I'm learning about my body. I'm 43 years old. I still don't know some of the, some of the things I'm learning online from these midwives. I'm like, where were they when I was young? Where were they when I was having a baby, et cetera? Yeah. Mary, from your perspective, um, what role do you think midwives play in the community? Well, I think traditionally midwives have also worked very closely with immigrant populations. And in my own family, in my own family history, my um, mother, uh, my, my grandparents came to Illinois in, um, you know, in the uh, late teens, you know, 1915, 1918. And my mom was born in 1921 and her and all five of her sisters were born by an Italian, uh, a German midwife in this very small Italian town mm. where they were all coal miners. So, um, and, uh, and the midwife was so revered in the town that they named, my mother was named Hildegard, which isn't the most common Italian name. <laughs> mm -hmm. And because she was named after the German midwife and her, the woman who lived next door and had her five daughters, one of those daughters was named Hildegard as well. So very well the, respected. Yeah, it's very well respected. She and, did a good job. <laughs> yep, yep. So, and modern times, you know, I do believe that women really are starting. I mean, we have a group of young women now that are giving birth that have been raised, you know, with title, well, here in the United States, with Title IX and equal opportunity. Um, so they really respect what their bodies can do mm -hmm. and are coming to us as mid midwives to have more of a partnership in care. I love, I love hearing that because, um, so one of the reasons why I went, when I started writing this book, I had all these questions for my grandmother and I was pregnant and I wanted to ask her these questions. And I, I ended up, she ended up going into the hospital and then I ended up, um, in heart failure after having my daughter. And unfortunately I had a doctor who, when I was trying to explain how I was feeling to him. He said, oh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. You're going to be fine. Oh, you can't breathe. Just take a bath. You'll be fine. And two days later, I was rushed to the emergency room with heart failure. And then my, my grandma passed away a couple of weeks later, never getting to meet my daughter. Just it was a, it, a very traumatizing time. And even looking back on it, it's, you know, it, I struggle with it. And I wish I would have had a midwife, an advocate, somebody who could, you know, speak up for me during that time. But that was sort of the impetus of deciding, you know, once I got better, deciding I want to find out, you know, about my grandmother, about my mom. She was trying to take care of us all. 
And um, that strength of, of Italian women, you know, like my mom and, and, and like my grandmother, I wanted to get those answers after I finally recuperated. But, but yeah, the doctor was not, you know, my, it, didn't, it didn't end up turning out so well. And I'd love for you to kind of talk about, Mary, you know, how, how do you ensure that women are respected and treated in a dignified ma manner and actually listened to during the, the birth process? You know, we're, we're going through this COVID lockdown right now. And I think there's a baby boom going on because of it to a large extent. And so I'm just curious, how are we making sure women are respected and, and treated well and how do midwives help with that? Well, I think traditionally and a hallmark of our midwifery education is, you know, to be a midwife means to be with women, right? I mean, that's the name, that's how it translates. Mm -hmm. And to function within that tradition, uh, midwives listen to their patients and they understand that every patient comes to, um, their setting, either their birth or a, an outpatient visit um, with a unique set of desires and needs. And when a provider, when as a provider, you honor informed, true informed consent, it becomes easy then to deliver compassionate person-led care that can be very equitable. Mm -hmm. So I think as midwives, you know, by honoring, um, consent, we honor our profession and we give women choice. And it seems so simple when you explain it like that, really. And it's yeah. our education programs. It's yeah. the hallmark of how we are educated. Yeah. Taking care of women. It's pretty simple. <laughs> it's funny how we complicate it, but it is, it's, it is, it comes down to that, doesn't it? Sibylla, from your perspective, um, what, what do you, what do you think? Um, Oh, I think that um, one crucial element is is that you know we know that m the majority of women uh, will still choose the hospital as a place of birth, um, but we have this huge research and evidence now that there are also other places where uh, women can birth, just mm -hmm. like country years ago, like home and you know low risk uh, birth unit, and and I think now we m midwives. Um, they, in Italy, I think the independent midwives can really uh, empower women in explore this, explore where they want to give birth, not just taking for granted that, you know, it's going to be a hospital delivery be just mm -hmm. because. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, um, I think one, um, element of this, that is so natural for me here in, in England, because here it's like, the ABC is like the plan of birth, il piano del parto. In Italy, it's something new. Like mm. I was speaking to my colleague who practices as an independent, independent midwife in, in Sicily, and she say the piano del parto, il, the, the birth plan, is, 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 that, is the tool that the woman that can use to, to kind of access the place, the right place of birth for her and to make sure that her wishes are respected and mm. you know it, it's a like it's it's a written tool so you know no one you know we should all you know read it respect it and you know yeah I, achieve it yeah. but, um it's interesting because it, it again it seems so basic taking care of women having having a, a tool you know a plan and a tool but i remember when i was pregnant and they talked about having a birth plan they almost you know it was like people made fun of that like oh that's your birth plan well nothing's going to go to plan but you know and and i think that just goes to show you know that we've got a world that's not revolving around women's needs <laughs> Basically, if we if we're laughing about something like a birth plan, it should be so basic to, to take control yeah, exactly. of what you want in that particular situation. Really. And I don't really like the, the name of it. It's not a, you're not planning a birth. You're just mm. writing down what you, you wish wishes. for that, yeah. which can be just emotions. We it just can be simple things. But if you put it in writing, then we should all use that as mm -hmm. a starting point to mm -hmm. listen to the your woman you're looking after and, and, all, and the care you're gonna provide. Yeah, you know? great. Jennifer, do you have anything to add on this point? Yeah, well, um, I mean, my research traces the medicalization of, of childbirth. And one of the critiques of medicalization is that it divorces women from their embodied experience of, of being pregnant. Um, and one of the things I think we mm. should remember when we think about obstetrics today is that as a field, obstetrics really professionalized on the backs of vulnerable poor women and, and women of color in the mm. U.S. 
Um, and so it was a particularly sort of exploitative kind of knowledge that, that was produced. Um, but if you think of um, pregnancy, you might say, of course, it's, it's an embodied experience. Um, but in the past, it was, it was more so, right, women's own sensation of, of the child quickening when the child could move um, was an indication of, of when that child supposedly gained a soul or, be, or became alive. And now we have all of these external diagnostic tools and technologies that tell us when you're pregnant and an ultrasound to give mm -hmm. us an indication of how the child is doing amniocentesis. And now um, we have genetic counselors. And so it's externalized. The sort of the experience of being pregnant and giving and giving birth. And I think that midwifery is something that tries to sort of reattach women to the physical experience um, really of having good. a baby. That's very interesting. Very, very interesting and complimentary way to think about what we're hearing presently. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> one of the things um, in the book, one of the aspects, you know, what I, I tried in the novel when, when I was thinking through, you know, obviously this starts in 1914 and then goes through the rise of fascism and into World War II. And it, it is a love story, but it is very much a story of these women. And I tried as much as possible to explore womanhood and motherhood in all the different ways and, and things that happen and so forth. And of course, you know, during that time period, unfortunately, child loss was something that was very common. And child loss is something that is experienced today. I've had it, you know, in my, in my own family, obviously it's, you know, everybody has people in their family who, who've gone through things like this. Um, and Sibylla, I know that you particularly focus on bereavement. I'd love to hear more about kind of what's happening today with bereave, child bereavement and, and pregnancy bereavement, especially because it seems like anyway, from my point of view, it seems like a bit of the you know, hush, hush, quietness of it is going away and it's becoming something that can be talked about and shared. What, what, what are you seeing and, and how, you know, what, how did you decide to get into that side of things? Yeah, so um, I think uh, I, I'm the bereavement midwife here in one of the hospitals in London because there's a, there is a role here that you can do, like it's recognized. So I'm, I'm a midwife, but I'm the bereavement midwife. So I look after families who are touched by loss. Um, if I think about Italy, there is not even um, a role as such. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean that midwives don't look after family who experience loss, they still do. Mm -hmm. But there is no ownership, like there's no um they don't there is no recognition that there, mm -hmm. there can be a dedicated midwife that is your point of contact your point of uh, connection you know I'm, I'm the interface for the hospital but i'm not just that i'm i'm also um their point of contact so when they're through they, they, they're going through their journey through grief um they can communicate directly with me and be reassured that what they're experiencing is normal I think mm. that, you know, this fear around these overwhelming emotions that you experience after loss and, and to have someone, one face, one person that knows your story um, and can reassure you that everything is normal and can also act if there's anything that is not normal. I think it makes the journey more healthy. We know Mm -hmm. grief is a healthy way it's it's a it's healthy for us as human mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. and I just make sure that they you know that that journey is, is as it should be that's amazing um Mary so uh, it's interesting Sibylla that you showed the difference between Italy and UK on that Mary from your perspective how is that being handled in the U.S. is it evolving it is evolving and you um you see evolution now in um palliative care for um, children that are born with um, um, abnormalities that are incompatible with life. And the hospitals now are starting to have palliative care uh, programs for, for those children that are born. So I think that in the US we are coming along in that and we're not necessarily in the hospital hand, um, situations, leaving it in the hands of the chaplain who you know somebody may have met yeah. or uh, the nurses here have um, oftentimes uh, labor and delivery units have one or two nurses that are the bereavement nurses. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so they receive training and lots of support groups. And mm -hmm. so it's moving along. To me, I find the palliative care a very interesting um, 
development within our hospital systems, you know, as more children are, um, you know, born severely premature or yeah. you know, people opt some to, maybe to uh, give birth to a child that has a disability that is incompatible with life. Mm -hmm. Very interesting to see the, the evolution. Jennifer, from your side of things in terms of, um, you know, how are people dealing with bereavement? How are people dealing with baby loss historically in Italy? Yeah, well, I think some people um, assume because infant mortality and childhood mortality was so high that parents didn't get at, as attached to their children. Um, but the evidence suggests that, in fact, that it's opposite, that parents, um, you know, experienced great, great loss um, and were very much affected by the death of their children, whether, you know, as, as infants or, or young children. Um, but just as one example, um, uh, something I find really poignant is that in different parts of Catholic Europe, um, if a baby died without baptism, um, and this again was, you know, uh, we think of it maybe more symbolic today, but it was, it was uh, fundamental um, for people at the time. Uh, it meant again that the baby had, had gained an identity, been a part of the community. Um, sometimes an unbaptized infant couldn't be buried in consecrated soil um, in a churchyard. Um, but in any case, if, if a baby died without baptism, sometimes uh, mothers, sometimes in conjunction with midwives, would take the baby to um, uh, noted miracle shrines that were um, related to this, and um, they would entrust uh, a, a woman to help them bring the baby back to life for just a few moments. And the baby might cry or urinate or do something else to indicate that it was alive. Um, and the idea was that um, the baby came back to life briefly so that it could be baptized. Wow. Now, did this really happen? We, we don't know. But the point is that it was of such importance for parents to, to believe that their child had been baptized, that its soul mm. was going to be okay, that it could be buried in, in the churchyard, they could visit that child, it had an identity, it had a name, it had a place in the community, um, that this miracle practice mm -hmm. um, uh, existed and, and lasted for quite a long time into I think, the 18th century yeah. in some places. So. Wow. And, you know, I thought when I was um, doing research, I think it, I think it was in, in your piece uh, that you mentioned that midwives were sometimes given the right to, to do baptism, emergency baptisms, which I just find, you know, fascinating. That's the priest's role. Yeah. That's a man's role to do baptisms, but they, they were willing to give the midwife that, that power. And mm -hmm. I found that really fascinating. Um, very, very interesting. Um, while I was researching, some of the upsetting things that I discovered in the novel was really, you know, when it came to Mussolini and his control over, over women's bodies. That was something that, you know, certainly we, in America, we don't study much about what happened in World War II Italy and, and certainly not the lives of women. And, you know, Mussolini, he wanted to control he wanted to control the population. He wanted to drive births and, and control women's bodies so that he could have an army so that he could have more population to you know, extend his empire. And women were, were really a vessel for the state. The, the, their bodies became a vessel for the state. So the idea that contraception and educating women about how to proceed with caution or coitus interruptus, those things actually became illegal, which is just crazy. So if a midwife couldn't even educate on those topics, that was that was so shocking to me to hear. Can you can you talk a little bit about Mussolini's impact and why he was doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, one of the defining features of the fascist state in Italy that it was that it was intensely pro-natalist, meaning exactly what you're talking about, Jennifer. That Mussolini wanted to grow the population quite prodigiously, in fact, um, both for the purposes of building a strong labor force at home, but also for colonization efforts in places like Ethiopia and Libya mm -hmm. and other parts of North Africa. Um, but what this meant in practice was um, both uh, repressive and, and coercive aspects like you're talking about. So um, the making of sort of all public talk about contraception, illegal, um, criminalizing abortion, even more so than it had already been criminalized, um, and making um, anybody who in some way impeded, and this is sort of um, uh, the exact quote, impeded the fecundity of um, the Italian state uh, was a, a crime against the state. Um, 
And so um, a scholar named Victoria de Grazia mm -hmm. talks about um, the fascist period as a period where women were nationalized. Um, but by that, she means that women's um, roles as wives and, and mothers in particular were sort of valorized and, and politicized in a way that ultimately um, domesticated them. And some of the advances that a lot of women had experienced um, across Western Europe and in the U.S. during World War I um, were, were reversed um, in Italy as, as elsewhere as sort of women were sent back into the home. Yep. Um, but one of, the, one of the things I find most fascinating about um, Mussolini and the fascist regime's impact on, on women and midwifery is that the fascist regime wasn't just sort of retrograde and conservative, right? Um, the fascists were fascinated with modernism and rationalism. Mm -hmm. And so they attempted to take that approach to childbirth in the aim of preventing um, infant loss. Um, and so midwives were, were professionalized in ways that they hadn't been before. Um, a national midwifery union was formed, which on the one hand seems like progress, but on the other hand, um, Mussolini also, yeah, right, control, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, a way into those communities, right? Um, but of course, Mussolini also promoted the fields of obstetrics and pediatrics. And so mm -hmm. midwifery was, um, sort of in relation um, uh, diminished in, in sort of its uh, midwife scope of, of expertise. Um, but then the sort of um, the effort at extreme rationalization took really sort of interesting um, manifestations. So this is applied to, to pregnancy, to childbirth, and even to, to areas like breastfeeding, where um, women um, were encouraged to um, do things like, like weigh their child and then breastfeed and then weigh the child again. And so the fascists took these sort of like time work management um, practices that had been um, developed during industrialization associated with Fordism and applied them to childbirth, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you and know, if it wasn't hard enough, to right, her, right, right. Let's add those yeah. things onto it. You know, yeah. and by the way, have five, have five babies, and then do all that, and and, and keep yeah. this rigid schedule. You're feeding exactly every yeah. hour and forty five minutes, and weighing yourself, and sort of keeping track of how much milk each breast is is yeah. producing. Right. Um. So this sort of just extreme control, yeah. Um. Of of the body in the name of rationalization. Wow. Um, it's strange Thank because it, they're, they're paradoxical aspects, right? Um, you know, under the fascists, the first national organization devoted to um, maternity and infancy was also founded, which, mm -hmm. you know, still has sort of um, the long uh, roots exist today. Um, but again, all in the name of, of promoting of the cause, nationalism and, yeah. and, and controlling women's bodies. Well, I'm curious, Sibylla, I mean, you, you grew up in Italy and obviously it was quite a bit after Mussolini's reign, but do you, do you feel like that, that was an impact? Do you feel like it impacted Italy in any way? What, what, what do you think was the outcome of that for later, later Italy? Um, very difficult to say. It's mm. such a hard, hard, um, it's very hard to pinpoint because um. I think I think if I think of you know being a midwife in Italy, being a woman in Italy, I think it, it would be so hard to come across and and face things like contraception and te social termination. Mm. I mean, I cannot believe that we're still that we're bringing this up, you know, today. Like, it, it, there is a need clearly, but it shouldn't be a need, isn't it? We should be able to talk about social termination and contraception. Right with the freedom that mm -hmm. comes, you know, with our identity as women. But yeah. clearly it's not like that. Italy especially, I think mm. over here is a bit better, but I think Italy is just, everything is such a taboo. The system mm -hmm. is so rigid, controlled by family, you know, even loss is the same. Grief, yeah. when you experience a loss, you just sort it out within the family. You, yeah. It's not normal that you reach out for help and you reach out for other, for external support it's the same yeah. i think fascinating mary do you have anything to add on this on this point particularly well I, you know you look at what's going on in the united states right with uh, uh the mixing of uh women's reproductive rights and religion and i mean it's we're moving backwards not forwards yeah yeah i, 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 think, I, I we... think that 
you know, yeah. it's something you can't really uh, escape, you know, they defund, when you start to defund, uh, you know, organizations that want to help with reproductive rights. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I hope is I hope that um, people read this book. And what, what's different is this is not just a World War II book where we plot people into 1943 and get them into the action. Not that there's not action, but what's important is you see the progression of a woman's life over this time. And yes, things are going on in Rome that, you know, maybe, maybe only come into play every once in a while, but it's really that progression of control that happens over time. And you let go of a little bit, a little bit, and a little bit. And before you know it, you know, you're in a very bad place. And I think we would be silly to think that we can't get to, to that place today, just as, as they did back then. So I think it's a, it's a big watch out for women. Thank you. I know we are um, at 40 minutes right now. So I just want to quickly say, can, can I ask like a rapid fire question in terms of, you know, you guys get to have this experience at this moment when a new life is coming into the world, something only women can do. Men cannot do this. This is something that, you know, International Women's Day and being a, a woman who has a baby or who chooses not to have a child, it's, it's all part of being a woman, but you guys get to be there at that moment. And Jennifer, you've read about all of this. Tell me something that is like a, a really rewarding experience or a funny memory or something. Just give me something, rapid fire. Sibylla, you go first. I'll go first. Okay. Yes. Um, oh, I, yeah, I always bring this up because this is, you know, it's such a precious memory for me. I, I, I met the woman um, one day a few years ago um, when I was in labor ward and she came and sadly had a, a term, like a nine month, I think the day of the due date, she had a, this, um, this loss, yeah. And she delivered this, this baby with me within an hour after meeting me because, you know, she felt she was comfortable and it just cracked on you know labor came and she delivered with me and I looked after her and everything was fine she had a follow-up with us three months after and then and then that's it I stepped back like I usually do with every family and I just uh, didn't hear from her for for ages for years and then a few years after I was talking to one of my colleagues and she said um oh I just brought someone downstairs to labor ward and then she knows you and I was like okay fine thank you um I went back and I checked on the board that I could see her name I was like oh my god she's having another bit she's having her rainbow baby you know baby after loss so I just waited until she delivered and I popped in to say hi because I had to she didn't communicate with me that she was pregnant again so it was such a big surprise after that bond there uh, at the time of the loss and I opened the door and she looked at me and it's such a you know what a moment she just looked at me and she said um well, I, you know, I knew you would find me, you know, like uh, oh, I was that's... so hoping you would see me here, you know, so I came in, we had a big hug. It was, it was, um, what a moment, you know, there's a, there's a bond that is born, you know, when, beautiful. when everything is lost and then stays mm -hmm. forever. Sharing, sharing, you know, the ones who went to heaven, just as well as the ones who got to stay here with us. Yeah, that's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. Jennifer, yeah. any, any funny stories from the past or interesting, sweet things? Well, Sibylla's story just made me cry. So I'm going to say something funny. <laughs> um, uh, one case I always love talking about, and, and this, is, this is maybe a little different, but um, uh, a priest was going to to baptize a child and said, ego te absolvo, instead of I will baptize you, essentially giving the baby the last rites. And the midwife stepped in and said, no, no, no. <laughs> and she's like, I'll do it myself. Oh uh, my gosh. <laughs> love it. Love it. Well done. That's good. Okay, Mary. Well, I, you know, I mean, every day is different, right? Because every woman has her own and family have their own unique experience. So, you know, every birth to me is, uh, you know, you feel honored just to be in that space with someone. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, uh, I, I always say to people, it's, I have the best job in healthcare in the world, you know? I mean, when it is sad, it is very, very sad, but uh, you know, even you probably are at your best if at the saddest times you can give women uh, solace, right? And family solace, so wow. it's, it's a great wow. place to work, you know? I love that, I love that. I really love what you guys do. And I, I, I'm so glad we're having this panel because I really don't think that we, we talk to midwives enough and get these stories. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go to some questions now. I'm going to go into the Q&A first. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, is there a professional difference between doulas and midwives? Um, Mary, can you answer that? So in the United States, so a doula is a paid um, uh, labor support um, and a midwife has some professional training. Uh, in the United States, we don't have one single tract of midwifery education. So mm -hmm. you can either be a certified professional midwife that are um, uh, legal to practice in some states, or you can be a certified nurse midwife where you're an RN to begin with, and then you get a post uh, baccalaureate degree in midwifery. Um, okay. So a doula is a paid or unpaid, a volunteer labor support. Thank you. Okay, here's a question for Sibylla. Um, you mentioned that briefly that UK midwifery is very common. Is the UK in the forefront of the modern world when it comes to midwifery compared to the US? Um, how many births are with midwives versus doctors? What, what would you say about that, Sibylla? Oh, I think it's definitely with, within the midwives. Just to give an example, the labor ward in the hospital where I work, but it's just one example of many, you have 11 midwives and one doctor. So, well, you know, all the labors, you know, you, it's just midwifery led, although it's high risk and, and the doctors only step in when it's needed. So mm -hmm. I think it's definitely in the hands of the midwives. And I think UK has broad research on midwifery and obstetrics. So uh, um, in many, many ways, um, UK is leading, but I don't mm -hmm. know compared to U USA, I think compared to other countries in Europe, definitely. Mm. I have to give a plug for this woman, Midwife Pip. I don't know if you guys follow her, but wow. I mean, her posts are so incredible. And um, really as a woman who is not planning on having any more babies, uh, she's, a, she's a UK midwife and she's young. She's, she just got pregnant recently herself. And she is just really educating young women about their bodies and, and older my, women my age as well um, about their bodies. It's really incredible. I think the UK is, is quite advanced. Um, Jennifer, have you ever vi visited one of these shrines that you mentioned? Um, are, are these places still open to families? Geez, um, I know I've uh, never actually been to uh, one of them myself, but I imagine just from sort of knowing the, the landscape in Italy and rural Italy that they do still exist. And, you know, I've often seen sort of shines and, you know, walking in the mountains and you're in the middle of nowhere. And then there's, there's candles and there's votives and there's little prayer cards. And so um, I do think there's uh, very much about a popular attachment, you know, even if women aren't bringing their children there to be, you know, come alive again, um, that there probably is some sort of historical memory with a lot of these places. Okay. One more question for you, Jennifer. Um, were there any primary, uh, so were there any oral histories that you've come across um, in your history that stand out? Any interviews recorded that could be looked up um, or that you guys might, might be able to share? Ooh, um, this is just a little area of my expertise. So most of my research is in the 18th century. So I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have any oral histories or recordings, unfortunately, but they're yeah. very well maybe for the early 20th century. Yeah. I imagine there's been a lot of like um, uh, folklore work and ethnography in, um, uh, in Italy, particularly in the South. So I imagine it exists. I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I don't know where, where to point that person to. Okay, no worries. Yeah, from my side, just in my research, I would say, you know, um, it was it, everything that I was getting had to be through kind of, you know, uh, it, it had been through somebody hearing a story and hearing a story because if it was a, a bit removed and then and then the research that, you know, um, uh, PhDs like like you have done. Um, there was a question, where do you find a, a midwife in, in the USA, Mary? How do you go about finding a midwife? Well, it's actually pretty pretty easy. You can Google find a midwife and the mm -hmm. American College of Nurse Midwives uh, mm -hmm. has a little tool that you can type in your zip code and where you live and uh, it will list out all of the certified um, nurse midwives or certified professional midwives in your area. Okay. And or so check with your insurance company. <laughs> they, they, you know, were credentialed under most major U.S. insurance companies. But find a midwife is through the American College of Nurse Midwives is probably the best way to go. Okay, good. That's great that we were able to tell people about that. Thank you. Um, Sibylla, are midwives celebrated on the Festa della Donna in Italy in particular? Um, are there any traditions for the Festa della Donna that you can reflect on as being native Italian? Um, 
not the midwives. I think it, it, is, um, it is a day that in Italy is really well celebrated. And, and when I moved over here, I actually saw today on Facebook one of my memories from the first year when I moved that I was like, oh, here, no one says anything about, about the, you know, the Otto Marzo. So I was like, oh, in, but if you talk about it, then people know, you know, the story about the Otto Marzo. But I think in Italy, it's far more celebrated as women, but not as midwives, not as far as I know, no. Okay. Great. Um, there's so many questions. I'm going to, I'm just going to skip over from the Q&A and pop to the chat so I can make sure that I get some, any of the questions that might have been around the chat. Um, there's so many questions, which is wonderful. Um, great, great, great. Let's see, looking through the chat. Um, how were midwives trained uh, a long time ago? Jennifer, can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my book, Contested Deliveries, actually traces the first um, official public midwifery schools and maternity wards. Um, and that happened in the 18th century. So before that, midwives were usually trained by apprenticeship. And we see a lot of female networks. So midwives learning from their mothers or sometimes from other female relatives like aunts. Um, and it's sort of interesting because even when attempts by state and medical authorities to better control midwives were put into place through these professionalization programs in schools, there was a lot of local resistance, often just sort of like passive resistance where people were told you have to go to school to be a midwife and they just didn't. Um, but one thing, um, one thing I've seen a, a lot uh, that's sort of funny is that Initially, one of the, the only requirements for a license was that women attended an anatomy, a, a dissection of um, a uterus mm. and, um, uh, and, and take an exam. And, and so women would write in and they'd be like, oh, well, like I've taken the exam or I'm happy to take the exam, but like, I don't really have time to go to this anatomy because I'm like out here working, you know, with the woman that I'm apprenticing with. And I don't really think going to anatomy is gonna tell me anything that I can't learn it actually being, you know, at the side of women when they're giving birth. Um, yeah. So there's a, a um, considerable effort to professionalize and sort of greater, put greater control um, on, on midwifery, but also particularly in Italy, a lot of resistance. Um, mm. this, the narrative that gets told in, um, in England and, and the U.S., interestingly enough, is sort of men come in very quickly and um, you know, place themselves as sort of the, the trusted and authoritative birth experts. And in Italy, midwives really, really resist that, that transition. Right. Yeah. When I was doing the research for the book, I went to the University of Padova and um, I was able to see an exhibition called Venire alla Luce to come to the light which is such a beautiful way of looking at birth. And they had all the anatomical models from the late 1800 and, and early 1900s that some of the midwives and my great great grandmother would have been one because she, she did train professionally um, at the University of Padova. And so it was interesting to see all of those, but I brought my daughter and literally she, you know, we went into this kind of, you know, dust filled room and, we, you know, there was light pouring through and all of a sudden we just saw, you know, uh, models and, and basically vaginas all, all the way up the walls, you know, just, just these anatomical antique, antique uh, models of these. And of course, my daughter at the time was, I think, 10 or 11. She's like, okay, mom, you always bring me to interesting places while you're researching this book. And I'm like, well, you know, it's the female body. There's, you know, and, and these are antiques, by the way, in front of you. So really interesting. Um, if you want to see what those look like, you can go to my website, uh, boldwomanwriting.com. And there's some pictures of those, uh, of some of the tools that the midwives uh, used and, and their heavy bag. I mean, I read a lot too about how heavy that bag was and they would, they would just walk up the mountainside and, and in the rain and anything that they needed to do to bring these babies. And gosh, I, I grew such a respect for these women realizing what they, what they had to do. That, that heavy bag had, was, a, was a big part of you know, what was in my mind, thinking of do, you know, what, what they did just to take care of women. Um, let's take two more questions before we close out. Um, can you speak to the US professional midwifery organization support and inclusion for women of color to become professional midwives? Great question. Um, Mary, do you mind taking that? Um, yes, I mean, they, uh, they have a checkered past, like many professional organizations in the United States do, um, mm -hmm. about um, inclusion of women of color. They, this over, you know, they are moving forward and trying to be uh, inclusive and make sure that um, opportunities are available. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'm just going to take a last question. I'm sorry, I can't get to all of them. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. The next question is, did women in the past always give birth at home? Or did uh, the midwife uh, used to also go to the hospital, I think is what they're asking. Um, Jennifer, so can you take that? Yeah, yeah. So in Italy, um, hospital births come pretty late. Um, so I think they read into the 30s, still like above 90% of women were giving birth at home. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that the hospital <laughs> as an institution has undergone in a sort of amazing transformation the last couple of hundred years, whereas there were maternity wards starting in the 1700s, but these were not places that you wanted to go, just like sort of hospitals were not places where you wanted to go. Um, they were sort of a last recourse for, for the indigent, for the poor. Um, or for um, particularly um, in the case of, of childbirth for, for women who um, were pregnant out of, out of wedlock. Mm. Um, these were also some of the first places that men got firsthand experience. Um, so I, that's what I mean when I said that the um, profession of obstetrics sort of professionalized on, on the backs of, of poor women. Um, mm. This is where uh, a lot of men were able to see childbirths for the first time. Gotcha. Um, and then of course, before um, the development of antisepsis in the late 19th century, um, maternity wards were sort of notorious for, for spreading infection. Purple mm. fever um, was a very, very common um, infection that um, uh, mothers um, caught after labor. And so these places were generally just, um, you know, sort of- sites You didn't of, wanna be there. Okay. A lot of death and destitution, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay, so mostly home. Okay, so in closing, um, I just want to read you a quick statement that's um, part of the opening of my book. The strength of the world is in its women. The power of the world is in its women. Yet it is the women we erase. Some women are unwilling to be forgotten or to forget, particularly if they are Italian. So whether women choose to be mothers or not, you guys have really helped us today to understand the role of midwives. And the one thing that's been common through all this is their connection to helping women. And personally, I learned, I learned a lot today. And I think it would have been un unappreciated if we hadn't have had this discussion. So I really, really appreciate that. And that's, that's absolutely worth celebrating on International Women's Day. So thank you, ladies. Grazie. Grazie to you guys. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to, I'm going to choose the giveaway winner. I, I didn't just select it. I had like a little um, methodology and then I just went down and, and, and used that methodology to get the name. So the name of the winner, I hope it's okay if I give it out. It's uh, Leslie Gigliotti. Um, so Leslie, congratulations on, um, on winning the book. You will be getting the book in the mail. We'll, we'll get your address details uh, from um, the National Organization of Italian American Women. And I just want to say, um, before I turn it over to Pat, I want to, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed today's discussion. Please consider reading Under the Light of the Italian Moon. There's a free excerpt at jenniferanton.com. And there's a book club discussion guide that, you know, uh, continues this discussion that you can download there and have a very provocative conversation over coffee or wine with friends. The novel is available at many retailers online, but we would really love if you bought it from the I Am Bookshop, if you can because that helps support local businesses. And again, I just wanna say a huge thank you to Pat and the National Organization of Italian American Women. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, thank you, you prego, molto e mille grazie a tutti. We're very happy to have you here. And this was just so fascinating. And so we appreciate all of you who volunteered your time to be with us and share these stories, especially, uh, I guess Jennifer and Sevilla who are heading into the next day already and they've had a couple of really long days but it was also thrilling to have Jen, um, Jennifer and Mary here on stateside talking to us too so we hope we'll stay in touch and that you know we can have future programs together and let us know um, how we can also help you and support you. Um, in the meantime I just want everybody here to stay tuned for some messages from Noya and they'll be getting you'll have our, we have your email hopefully and we will send you updates on our future programming including our uh, upcoming 40th anniversary gala, which we're doing virtually this year, um, but you'll find more information um, in the Noya website and some other issues that we'll probably maybe put into the chat if we can, if you check there. Uh, also two other upcoming programs in honor of Women's History Month, we have two 
other um, events on March 15th, which is going to be um, a program sponsored by uh, Washington, D.C., Rhode Island regions called Mother Caprini, the Patroness of Immigrants. Um, that's a fascinating um, story of this um, American, Italian American saint. And also on March 19th, we're going to have our traditional annual celebration of St. Joseph's Day, and it will be a virtual movable feast perhaps, uh, but all the history too that goes back with the altar of St. Joseph and which is also the considered the Father's Day of um, Italy. So today we had the Mother's Day that we celebrate yes. in Italy with the Fiori, the Mimosa, but, but not, not the drinks with the flowers, but we're glad that we were able to share this time together. And so please thank you all again. And I hope you'll enjoy uh, Jennifer's book and you'll come back to Noya and have uh, participate in some of our other programs. Thank you all and just say, um, Good night and thank you again. And um, check the chat if there's any other uh, uh, information that we'll be reaching out to our winner of our book. So thank you all so much. Buonasera, ciao, buonanotte. Ciao.